am Councilmember Jan Perry. This is the Energy and Environment Committee. Today is Tuesday, July 19th. It's about 10 after 9 a.m. in the morning, and this is room 1010. Uh, Mr. CLA, let's go through the agenda and let me know whether there's any items for continuance or consent. Good morning, Madam Chair. Rafael Alfredo with the CLA's office. You have five item agenda. We'd like to recommend for consent item number four, which relates to a contract, DWP contract with OPEX relative to software maintenance services in connection with proprietary mail processing uh, equipment. Okay. Um, you have no uh, continuance items. All right, all right. Well, well that'll be, we don't have a quorum either, so okay. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, continue forward without okay. objection as a communication from okay. the chair. Okay. And then let's go back to item number one. Number one, CRO report relative proposed First Amendment to contract with Waste Management of California for landfill disposal services. Good morning. Wilson Poon with the CAO's office. Um, before I begin, I'd like to make a technical, technical correction to the report. If you look at the first page of the CAO report, under the comments section on the third line, um, I'd like to read into the record executed on July 1st, 2008 instead of 2007. Um, item one is a CAO report recommending that the council authorize the Bureau of Sanitation to execute the First Amendment to its contract with waste management to provide disposal services of grit and screenings collected at the Hyperion treatment plant. Um, grit and screenings are basically solids removed from the wastewater treatment process. They include materials such as rags, glass, wood, paper, and plastics. Uh, these materials have a high moisture content and also high, um, are contaminated with fecal coliform. The city currently does not have a facility to properly dispose of these materials. And so therefore, on July 1st, 2008, the city executed a contract, a three-year contract with waste management to dispose of these materials at a cost not to exceed $2.5 million. The Bureau is now requesting to extend the contract for an additional five years and increase the contract ceiling by $3.1 million. Um, the contractors continue to comply with all the city's contracting requirements. Um, however, the term of the contract will now exceed three years and in accordance with Ad code section 10.5, council approval is required to execute this amendment. Well, let me ask you a quick question. What were the barriers to uh, coming up with other options to recycle the material other than initiating a contract? But what were, were the barriers to us internally? Uh, my name is Emmanuel Allo with the Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, because of the uh, <coughs> uh, odorous nature of the material and uh, the a very high content of fecal coliform, it's highly contaminated with fecal coliform, so it's uh, treated at a special waste. So only certain uh, landfill schools are permitted, you know, to accept such material. And we had no capacity in, within the city to be able to uh, accommodate that level of uh, waste. Yeah, the, uh, the the city landfills are not uh, permitted to accept this type of waste. Okay. So, and, and then we had no. Basically, I'm just asking: Are there were there other options other than co contracting this out? Um, I think the, uh, that, uh, this this option is uh, I don't uh, we, the city we do not have uh, 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 or, or rather our existing landfills you know are not permitted to accept this type of waste okay. so we can't take it there. Um, does the contract amendment have any impact on the city's general fund on a going forward basis? Is there anybody here from the CAO's office? Um, I'm from the CAO's office. Um, no, the, fund, the funds will be provided from the sewer construction maintenance fund for the first year of the program, first year of the contract. Um, future year funding will be provided through the um, city's annual budget development process and subject to mayor and council approval. What would you characterize the first three years of the contract? Have there been any issues dealing with waste management? Can you repeat that question? Um, how, how, what would you... How would you describe the first three years of this contract? This is an extension. So have there been any issues, bad, good, or otherwise, with waste management? Um, what the performance been like? Okay, uh, they, they have been very reliable, and uh, they have provided us uh, very good exceptional services. Mr. CAO, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no. That's about it. Okay. That'll be a communication from the chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item number two relates to CR report relative to the PROPO, Clean Water Obligation Bond Program. 
Yeah, why don't we uh, come on up and then do, why don't I let Dr. Williams speak before we get into that. Dr. Williams, are you here? And then you stay there. And, uh, no, come on up now. I'm trying to move the meeting along. So why don't you come up now if you want to talk. Come on. <laughs> and thank you. Let me run the meeting, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clyde Williams, El Sereno, Northeast LA, also a LA 32 Neighborhood Council board member. Uh, Propo, one of the elements with Propo is it's a very large amount of money, $500 million. Uh, one of the things has appeared that we're actually getting cost savings on these projects. Interesting. How do we allocate the savings? Can we advertise to the neighborhood councils, coordinate with them? Because there's a lot of smaller projects that could easily take up the savings. Uh, we're doing one next week of spreading 500 cubic yards of mulch. Why? To reduce runoff and to improve infiltration of materials in El Sereno. So uh, there's a lot of ways of doing it if we know what the process is. One of the elements is finding out, is there a process for the allocation of savings from these projects and circulating that throughout the community and especially the neighborhood councils? Uh, last night, there was a meeting in the Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council. There, a uh, council member provided information regarding a potential project there, which would use the savings. So we need to have more circulation of such information. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor. All right, so let's have the uh, staff report. Good morning, Mara Kralla, Office of the CAO. The report before you is from the Proposition O Administrative Oversight Committee, which requests an adjustment to the Prop O program budget in the amount of um, $2.8 million for five projects. There includes the, the adjustments to the five projects include canceling the Cabrito Paseo walkway bike path project, adding the Elmer Avenue Paseo phase two project, adding the Glen Oak Sunland stormwater capture pro project, increasing the Machado Lake phase one project budget, and closing out the Grand Boulevard tree walls project. There are sufficient POPO program revenues to support the recommendations in this report. I'm David Hurrell with the talk to the CAO. Just here to support it. So help with questions. Oh, okay. Um, uh, question about uh, the Grand Boulevard tree wells, and your report noted that the project was completed under budget. Um, has the project been working as designed since construction was completed? And then I'll ask you about the budget issue. Wing Tam from uh, Bear Sanitation. Um, I actually went out to those sites personally and looked at those tree wells, and they are uh, working properly. Uh, there was one tree that um, didn't survive because it was vandalized, but that was replaced. Uh, so the, the whole system actually is, is functioning properly. Okay, and then as far as the pro pro excuse me, project being under budget, <coughs> what do you do with the money that you saved? Does it roll back into the fund itself or? Yes, uh, again, Mara Krala, Office of the CAO. In November 2010, the Administrative Oversight Committee uh, took action to designate savings as program contingency. Um, so the project savings from the Grand Boulevard Tree Walls project would be designated as program contingency. Um, there are two big projects that are in progress or are moving forward. That's the Machado Lake project and the Echo Park Lake project. Until those projects reach major milestones, um, it is recommended that the program contingent, the 
any savings remain in the program contingency. Just in case they're needed on the larger project. Exactly. Okay. So you're building up the contingency account as a, a cushion yeah. uh, in the event that uh, unanticipated uh, occurrences take place on these larger projects. Yes. Okay. All right. And what milestones do you have to reach with Machado and Echo Park uh, to, to activate uh, the possibility that you may need to use contingency? Kendrick Okuda, Bureau of Engineering. Uh, the milestones that we're looking for as far as uh, uh, the projects being would be near the end of the project's construction phase, um, Council Member. At that point, we'd be able, be able to uh, forecast the remaining balance or remaining amounts to, be, to complete the project mm -hmm. at that point. So um, it would be near the end of the construction phases of both projects. Thank you. All right, we'll do this as a communication from the Chair. Thank okay. you. Three. Number three. Number three. Mm -hmm. DOP report relative to proposed amendment number one with uh, Goldman Sachs and company in connection with this position of the Navajo Generation Station. <clears throat> so tell us Good morning, what Madam. Goldman Sachs is going to do. Uh, good morning. My name is Robert Roth with the Office of the CAO. The report before you is the First Amendment to the agreement between DWP and Goldman Sachs regarding the, divest regarding the uh, divestiture of uh, Navajo Generating Station from DWP. Uh, the current agreement was three years long and it's expiring this month, the end of this month, and this agreement, amendment to the agreement, would extend it five more years, ending in 2016. Will that be sufficient enough time for us to divest? from Navajo? I'll let the department comment more specifically on that. The, the time frame for divestiture, if everything took the longest amount possible, is about four years. So from the time we actually um, advertise until we would finally close would be about four years. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the, uh, the fees on this agreement are paid only at the completion of a transaction, whether acquisition or divestiture. And uh, they range from, uh, I'm sorry, the range, uh, it's based in a contractual term. It's 50 to 85 basis points depending on the value of the properties purchased or sold. And so the minimum fee, ma'am, is 3.5 million up to a transaction value of a billion dollars. So, so is this service fee, it sounds like it's a, a range or a sliding scale. Uh, is yes. it paid in phases or does it depend on the final sale amount? That's a great question. It's based on, it's paid at the end of an actual transaction. So, so it's based on a percentage of what the property is sold for? Uh, yes. Okay. And, that, and, and prior to that, prior to the closure of a sale, they won't be compensated. That is correct. So how do they cover their costs as they go through this? They, they build that into whatever the, um, how do they do that? I would like the department to comment specifically. Well, the fee is sort of like a, a real estate broker fee. The broker does all the work and then gets paid at the end. And that's, that's what would happen here. And that's it. So again, explain the basis points. Well, they have, um, there's a table that shows for various values um, up to a billion dollars, they make 3.5 million is a minimum fee. And then beyond that, it's 85 basis points going down to 50 basis points, depending on the values of the transaction. Is that the standard for the industry or how did, how did you derive that? Um, it was negotiated. This was a contract that was um, put out to competitive bid and it went through an RFP process. And we had, we negotiated the terms for the fees. So when the RFP was put out, and uh, how many responses did we get? I believe seven or eight respondents. Who was theirs the most competitive? Um, we, we selected two firms from that, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, and we determined they were the most competitive. Yes. And then what, what basis did you feel that they were the most competitive? Uh, based on their experience. Um, based on their price structure and based on the, the, the capabilities of their firm. 
So if they don't divest within the time period of the contract and they come back for another extension, what would you recommend? What would you mean? Would I recommend another extension if this one isn't long enough? Well, we're required to divest by 2019, so I think that this extension should be sufficient to accomplish the sale. Okay. Well, in the event that we don't, is there any language? In the event that something doesn't go the way that it should, is there any language in there to ensure that we don't continue to extend? No. Robert Roth, CAO's office again. There is a provision in the contract regarding termination, and it actually states that if the agreement was terminated, there's an 18-month period where this firm would still be compensated if a transaction were to be completed. It's in a sense to cover their costs, which they're investing right now. As far as continuing it beyond this point, there is no option to continue. So there's 18 months after the termination is sort of, again, efficient for them to recover their costs? That would be correct. So you could anticipate if it was going to close, if the transaction were to close within 18 months after this five-year term, there would be some, they do have a claim. Mr. Alarcon and Mr. Peretz have joined us, so we do have a quorum now. We are on item number three. If either of you have any questions. I apologize for arriving late. What was the reason for the extension? Well, the contract is expiring at the end of this month, and we have not concluded our sale of the Navajo Generating Station, which is a task that we've assigned them to help us with. And why is the reason we haven't finished? Well, it's sort of involved in the rate process and all of the things. It's one of the strategic initiatives that we're talking about as a part of our rates, divesting early. And so the process will take, you know, three to four years if everything goes the furthest length of time. Okay. I'm not understanding how that's an answer to my question. My question was why did we not complete the work in the prescribed time? Well, the first, the reason for that is we assigned them the task in 2008, and within. You're talking about Goldman Sachs? Yes. Okay. Within six weeks, they came back to us with a presentation, and that was just at the time of the financial meltdown. Bear Stearns had gone out of business. Lehman Brothers had gone out of business. And they told us that the people that they would be talking to to buy this property would not have the credit to purchase it at this time. So now was not a good time to sell. And so we sort of put it on hold for a period of time. Okay. So we're not wedded to sticking with Goldman Sachs? We're not wedded to them, although they have an existing task. Are they still under investigation for financial crimes? I do not know the answer to that question. Are they involved in municipal fraud investigations? Sir, I'm unaware of their current legal issues. Anybody else? I think there is a goal that we have to keep in mind is that we're trying to get off the poll. Goldman Sachs and some of those companies have had some very detrimental effects on our country's economy, and I think that's why my colleague is asking. I don't know if there's anybody here who can answer that question. If not, do you want to pursue this? Maybe we can hold it on the desk and see if we can get somebody up here. Yeah. I would like an answer to that question as to whether or not Goldman Sachs is involved in investigations relative to crimes against municipalities related to financial fraud. I would recommend that you get a city attorney to come and answer this for you. Okay. 
knowledge that I have thus far, I do know that Goldman Sachs previously settled a case with the Securities Exchange Commission. I don't know if there are any new charges that have been presented. Was it related to municipal fraud? I don't know if it was directly related to a municipal fund, but I can research it and provide additional information if you request. Absolutely. I believe they are involved in a national investigation at this time, and it may involve the city of Los Angeles. And I think it's ridiculous that we continue to transact with companies that are under investigation for defrauding L.A.'s taxpayers. So I would ask that we get complete information when we're doing business with any financial institution, particularly when it's on this scale. And I will try to determine what divisions, because obviously Goldman Sachs has various subsidiaries and affiliates, so I don't know if the current divisions or affiliates that are under investigation are related to the parties who are conducting business for us under this agreement. You know, they play that game about it's not – it's one subsidiary versus a different – it's all Goldman Sachs to me. Okay. You know, they're responsible. Their board of directors is responsible for all the subsidiaries. And, you know, so I think we need to review that. If, in fact, there are investigations of this type, and I would like to know what options we might have if this company is not doing business in a proper way, and what other competitors might be available to do this kind of work. As it relates to this particular contract, or you're asking for in general? Yes. As it relates to this particular contract. Who else can do this? Well, currently we don't have – we have J.P. Morgan under contract until July 29th. However, their agreement is set to expire, and we had utilized them for acquisitions. We tried to – Is there anybody that's not under investigation that might – Not under contract with the Department of Water and Power. Currently we have Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. Those are the two that were selected back in 2008. So you're suggesting that, or maybe implying, that we have to use a previously existed contracted company? No, I'm saying that they are knowledgeable. I know of impropriety during their conduct during this transaction. They've been pretty forthright as to advising the department, even though they're not being currently compensated. Yeah, well, if they ripped us off somehow, somewhere, anywhere, I don't know why we'd do business if we have an alternative. I just want to know what alternative companies that exist out there that can do this kind of work. I can advise you of what responses we received under our previous RFP, but to actually expand that list and make it current, we would have to issue another request for proposal. Okay, well, I'd like to understand those options. Mr. Allerton, I just spoke with the Chief Legislative Analyst, and we do have a bit of time until August 22nd. Okay. So that we can hold this in committee and make sure that your questions are answered, and any other members who have questions on this particular issue, we have some time. Okay, and if, in fact, the department is still going to recommend this contract, I would hope they would do it in the context of any of the questions that I'm raising. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burns, do you have questions? I essentially have the same question. If we didn't move forward, what are our alternatives? Well, if we don't move forward, as has been mentioned, they would have 18 months. If we were to close a transaction in 18 months, they would still have right to compensation. Beyond that period, they would have lost any opportunity to. So we would have to go out. If we were going to do something different, go out to RFP, select a new firm, and begin again. And in addition to our investment banker, we would also have to reissue a request for proposal for legal counsel as well on this transaction. And if you could reiterate for the record, we have to get off a poll by? Well, this particular ownership investment, we're required to divest by 2019. In our integrated resource plan, we had contemplated getting out five years early. And if we looked for an alternative, what would the impact be on cost and on timeliness? I'm assuming the cost would be, I mean, similar, and the timing we would probably lose 
maybe a year. Is it something you would recommend under that circumstance? I would add to that. I think we would lose more than a year because we would have to go through another request for proposal. That process took almost a year in and of itself. And then we would have to do the selection, and then we would have to get the new investment maker up to speed and also retain legal counsel, which took an additional eight months, which was part of the delay in this process. So I'm a little bit more pessimistic than Mr. Tharp. I think it would take an additional two years to get everyone on board and up to speed and then to release the offering memorandum and proceed with the process. And if our co-owners exercise their right of first refusal, that might take an additional three years to complete the transaction. So that was my original request for five years, two years to complete the process, and three years in case there's a right of first refusal. Do you have any sense of whether there are any real good guys in this field that would be viable alternatives? Good guys meaning they're not part of that investigation. Yeah, that's a politically loaded question. I don't know how to respond to that from a legal perspective. I've seen a lot of names in the paper, so I don't know. Thank you. Madam Chair, the first right of refusal opportunity, that exists with this current, as it stands today and or if we changed, right? The first right of refusal, that three-year implementation would exist regardless. That's correct. Okay. So we're back down to the difference being two years. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we weren't calculating two plus three. The three is already embedded regardless of what we do. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And we're divesting our interests in this particular plant, and that's something that's been going on for quite some time. When was it that this particular contract was commenced with Goldman Sachs? July of 2008. July of 2008. Okay. All right. And then also one point of clarification, Madam Chair, you mentioned that the council has up until August 22nd to take action, but according to what I see on the notes here, it says August 19th. Yeah. Actually, it's the council recess session. But the time limit file actually terminates. It's just a distinction between the scheduling, but actually it is August 19th. Okay. Because of the council recess. Because of the council recess. We have until the 22nd, but since we're already scheduled not to be here, then we just remind ourselves that we should handle this by the 19th. So let's pick a date before then so we can get these responses back. Do we? Yeah. Do I have another card on this item? All right. Evan Gillespie, you want to come up? Good morning. Evan Gillespie. I work with the Sierra Club here in Los Angeles. As many of you are aware at this point, the Sierra Club's top priority around the country is to help phase out old and dirty coal-fired power plants, particularly focusing on the Navajo Generating Station, which is ranked as high as third in the nation in terms of smog pollution in recent years. I appreciate the conversation, and I respect Mr. Alarcon's question about Goldman Sachs. It's a very fair point. I just want to take an opportunity to highlight the fact that the coal plant that we have a relationship with is also a tremendous bad actor when it comes to public health, environment, climate change, and really limiting opportunities for Los Angeles to start to redirect money away from coal companies that take our money, they go to D.C., they lobby against public health laws, they lobby against climate laws. They do a lot of things that Angelenos really, really firmly believe we should have be better safeguards for public health, things like that. So I wanted to highlight that point. The second point, in regards to the timing issue of when we sell that plant, that coal-fired power plant is going to be asked in the next year to install a very expensive pollution control technology to clean up its ozone pollution. That is going to cost a lot of money. The Four Corners power plant in the Four Corners region on the Navajo Reservation actually was just asked to invest $700 million in the same pollution control. So the longer we delay the sale and the longer we stay tied to the price of coal, the more expensive it is to clean up the pollution. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
tied to that plant, the value of that plant diminishes or the value of our asset diminishes. So I'd encourage the council to move forward and take a look at it and expediting the sale of the plant as much as possible. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I don't think anybody on the committee will lose sight of the fact that we need to close down this plant. I would like to just give the opportunity to get this information in response to my colleagues so that when they do take a vote, they do it with the comfort and the knowledge that they've gotten all the information that they're supposed to get as opposed to making a decision without having that information. Yes. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you. I'd just like to make a comment to the last speaker. I appreciate you coming forward and reminding us of the issues of the environment and how Angelinos feel, et cetera. But at the same time, I think that we would be delinquent as policymakers if we just focus singularly on one objective, one goal that is paramount and important not only to Los Angeles but to the entire environment around the world. But at the same time, that's one of the issues that we have to face as policymakers is that sometimes we have to consider other matters that are not, don't seem to be related to the main objective. But the fact of the matter, it is related. Councilmember Alarcon brought up some really good questions about what you described as a bad actor as far as a particular plant when it comes to the environment. Now we're talking about bad actors potentially that we may or may not be doing business with that we perhaps shouldn't do business with on behalf of the Angelinos that you referred to because they potentially have ripped us off. So the bottom line is we're not afforded, I don't believe that we're afforded the opportunity of following through with our legal responsibilities, our fiduciary responsibilities as elected officials if we just look at one objective and ignore all the rest. If I may respond just very quickly. I fully respect the question. I think it's a great point. No, no, no. See, the thing is you already said what you were going to say, but the thing that I'm trying to make a point to you is we seem to be doing just fine when it came to the environment because nothing in what this panel of council members said talked to delaying the actual closure of this particular plant. Or as a matter of fact, we're not even closing the plant. We're divesting our interests. So that doesn't mean that the plant is not going to still be number one on somebody's list of spewing out toxic, you know, noxious fumes, et cetera. But the bottom line is we're talking about divesting our interests in this particular plant. We can't control whether or not our partners exercise their first right of refusal and continue to have this plant in play and in use. But the thing is I remind you that you made, in my opinion, a comment that really was acceptable. You have the right to fill out a card and speak for a couple of minutes, but the bottom line is you did something that really bothers me when you try to remind us to focus on something that I believe that we did not get away from because we have to take other things into account. We can't look at things singularly. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Allard. One of the reasons I raise this issue is because I think they've been dragging their feet on this sale for profit reasons. I believe that we have, the city council has dictated with mayor's concurrence, a policy to close this plant. Goldman Sachs, as was testified to by DWP, has delayed this process because of market reasons, meaning that they were not making enough profit. They get a performance boost for selling this thing at a higher rate. So I'm not working against your interests. I think they'll drag their feet again if we keep them on board. And if we're going to push this policy through, you know, I believe that we need to scrutinize not just the financial interests here and protections against players who have generally tried to rip off the city and have, in fact, ripped off the city, but also from a policy perspective, I don't think they're performing. And because I don't think they care about our policies, they just want to make money. But I would also like to ask the city attorney in the report to come back with our out clauses on this. I don't think we're required to extend this contract. In fact, I'm reading this here. This is 
related to Senate bills, DWP is, is prohibited from entering into long-term contracts without the city council's approval. So I don't, I don't see, uh, I don't see uh, how uh, we have to do business with this company, even, even at this time. Um, I believe we have an out clause. And that is that, that um, if, if we don't believe they're uh, acting in accordance with our policies, uh, we don't have to continue the contract. Extend it, which, which would mean we could expedite uh, a new RFP. Okay, I will address your concerns at the next meeting schedule, but for ethical reasons, I, I want to correct the record. Uh, Goldman Sachs is not responsible for the delay in this process. They have advised us accordingly, and there have been internal decisions within the department that has delayed the action of issuing the offering memorandum. So I don't want to give the impression to this uh, committee. Oh, no, I, I, th I think it's very clear. You did not give that impression. I did. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have to correct the record uh, because I still believe they, they are, are complicitous in delaying this sale. Well, from, from my personal involvement with the transaction, they've been very ready to move forward, and they have not received the directive from the department to do so. So we'll bring this one back on the second round. Sure. Okay. And we'll work Thank with you. the city attorney, DWP, to answer the committee's question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We consented item four, so we're going to go to item five. And yeah, Madam Chair, would you like to just quickly, now that you have a quorum, just run yeah, through? Yeah, let's go back. Okay. So item number one, recommendation was to approve. Uh, item number two as well, relative to Propo, approved. Any amendment? Uh, Item number three, we're going to hold, and number four was also recommended approved. All right. Which relates to the contract with the we'll do that without OPAS. objection. Um, we're yeah. up to number five. You want to read the description into the Certainly. record? Certainly. Item number five relates to a motion, Englander Perry Garcetti, relative to the Board of Water and Power Commissioners and the Council's consideration of the OPA's independent analysis and the Council's independent third party report oh. as part of the review of water and power okay. reactions. Why don't we uh, also have uh, the speakers come up, and then uh, Nicole Bernson, and Chuck Bray, and uh, Dr. Williams. All right. Why don't you go first, Nicole? No. Thank you. Nicole Bernson on behalf of Councilmember Mitchell Englander. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. Uh, in 2004, Councilmember Greg Smith called for an independent third-party review of DWP rate actions, and every rate action uh, since that time has been subject to this review. The Smith Report is a critical tool for helping to guide the Council in its own review of rate actions. The voters also spoke loud and clear on March 8th when they approved measures I and J. Um, they demanded greater accountability and transparency for their utility. It's with this in mind that Councilmember Englander introduced the motion that's before you today. Uh, it asks that the Smith Report be made available to both the OPA and the RPA as an additional tool in their own review of DWP rate actions. It is critical that no DWP board action be taken to review the proposed DWP increase until the OPA and RPA are in place and have had the opportunity to fully vet the Smith Report and to prepare their own independent review. Only then can ratepayers be satisfied that proposed rate actions have been thoroughly, transparently, and independently reviewed. I therefore request on behalf of Councilmember Englander that you approve this motion and move it forward to Council. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Chuck, why don't you go next? Yes. Uh, item 5 on today's agenda is a motion by Councilmember Englander to <coughs> request the Board of Water Power Commissioners to consider the OPA's independent analysis report along with the Council's independent third party report as part of its review of water and power rate actions, including the June 2011 proposal. I commend Council members, the Council members' interest in supporting an independent, objective, and transparent OPA. However, I believe this motion as presented has some unintended negative consequences that make adoption very dangerous. While a motion requires the DWP board to consider the OPA's finding on any rate increase, it also perpetuates the Council's independent rate analysis consultant's report. If passed, there will be three reports to be considered by the DWP board. The department's rate request, the Council's consultant's report, and the OPA's report. 
most ratepayers will view this as an attempt to diminish the power of the OPA, even as it is created after overwhelming support by the voters. Think how easy it will be for future officials to say, we passed the rate increase in spite of the OPA because both the department and the council's independent consultant were for it. This is not a case where two out of three should win. If the truth is what matters. I would prefer that this measure be killed or rewritten. The neighborhood council's term sheet from a year ago asked that the OPA be given equal time to the Department of Water and Power Management to present its analysis in front of the Department of Water and Power Board. A motion to that effect would be more in spirit of Measure I. In the last analysis, though, this doesn't matter very much since any sizable rate increase will be decided by the council using Section 245 of the City Charter. The council members certainly won't let themselves be tied down by any required reading. I have copies of my letter, the, the, rate, the, the uh, report from the UCLA students that I spoke about my last time I was here, and the ratepayers advocate term sheet from last September. I would hope that all of these be included in the council that, file. You want to give that to uh, the city clerk uh, there. We can include that as part of the official record. And uh, when we're done with Dr. Williams, I just want to ask uh, Ms. Bernson for uh, clarification so that we all are on the same page. Dr. Williams. Dr. Clyde Williams, El Sereno. Uh, one little bit of background. I was an external auditor for ISO 9000 and 14000 auditor. One of the first things is what is the basis for comparison? What are the basis that the city council's representative will have? What are they comparing it against? Same way, and just a little while ago, question as to are we going to improve the environment or change the rates or both? And we had a discussion in the Sierra Club this last week as to that's one of the things regarding the <gasps> ratepayers advocate. It's not even mentioned here. So when do we give it? Does the passage of previous elections, votes, uh, take precedence over the OPA or over the city council's representative? I don't know. Can we have a rate increase without a ratepayers advocate in place and operational? Don't know. So one of the elements is, what are we comparing it against? The DWP has refused or has not provided a corporate strategic plan, which they spent two years trying to get with Huron. Where is it? Because I, as an auditor, I would usually go back, what is the principle of the company? And how do these actions compare with the principle of the company? If you have no principles, hey, anything's open. You know, coal may be transferred to nuke, a nice trade. So there's a lot of things that are going on. But the first thing is, what is the constitution of DWP? What is the strategic plan of DWP? We don't know. Thank you. Yes, um, the CAO did a report back in uh, 2004 or 2005 as a result of a, a increase that was requested by the Department of Water and Power at uh, close to 18 percent. The council subsequently um, issued a report as a result of some of the uh, review by the independent analysis, which lowered that increase to 11 percent. Uh, the process currently as adopted by the council includes a notification from the Department of Water and Power on their intent to increase rates and then subsequent to that uh, the CAO and the CLA are to uh, engage a, a third party uh, to review uh, the rate report. Uh, currently that is being uh, performed by PA Consulting. Uh, after the report is released the CAO then uh, allows for the Department of Water and Power general manager to make a comment. Uh, it does not change the report. It just is a comment in addition to the report. All of that is submitted to the city council. After it's submitted to the city council, then there's 
open review by stakeholders, by neighborhood councils, by the community, and then it's up to the council, as is their charter authority, to either increase the rate or not increase the rate, and that is subject to part of the process. So, Ms. Bergson, this motion is not attempting to circumvent the rate payer or advocate or the Office of Public Accountability. It is more public information for the rate payer or advocate to have as a tool for analyzing rate increases based on the contributions of Council Member Smith and Mr. Englander's carrying on that work. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you making the distinction. The important aspect of this is it does create an additional tool. It provides greater transparency. The third-party review is a review of the action by, you know, in the case of PA Consulting, a firm with engineering expertise, utility expertise, et cetera. The rate payer advocate is exactly that, an advocate for rate payers, and we would expect that they would want the most information possible to inform their own review. And then just so Mr. Ray understands, I know that there's another effort coming down the line, and I think people are so excited in our anticipation of the Office of Public Accountability and the rate payer advocate being set up that they're already preparing motions that will end up in the lap of the rate payer advocate to, you know, hit the ground running. So I think you'll see a number of motions coming through even before the office is set, basically creating a work plan for this RPA because, you know, basically we can hardly wait. I do think you have the will of the body, given that this was passed and this is what the voters asked for, that we want to have the RPA in place so that we can have informed, dispassionate, impartial analysis from as many sources as possible to funnel into the Office of the Rate Payer Advocate for overall analysis. But actually, you know, I think the more information, the better we all are, especially if it's done on a public record. Did Mr. Park just have a comment? Yeah. One thing that I'd like to make it clear is what I see in this effort is, as the chairwoman just said, is more transparency and more information and more third-party analysis. And with that analysis, anybody can utilize that analysis. It becomes a public document. It doesn't just get shared with the council members and we hide it. That becomes a public document and, you know, that information will be disseminated on paper, electronically, et cetera, and then people can criticize it, they can tear it up, they can do what they wish with it. And even the future executive, the future Rate Payer Advocate at the department could actually use that document. Perhaps they don't use it as a primary document, but as a tertiary document to fortify whatever decisions they're contemplating or they're making or forwarding to the decision makers at the Department of Water and Power and the council, et cetera. So one of the things that comes to mind is, having been a former businessman myself, when you – I'm looking at this from an investment vantage point, an investment in more information at the beginning and prior to a decision being made, especially when I'm assuming that these reports perhaps – it might seem like a lot, but I can't imagine that these reports would be any more than in the low hundred thousands of dollars. But when you look at the actual actions that take place, we would be setting rates perhaps, especially when it comes to increasing rates, to the tune of millions of dollars a month to – across the board to our Angelenos, our rate payers. And that's an investment well made, because if we choose not to agree to a rate increase, that's an impact of million dollars per month, which means over decades that's tens and hundreds of millions of dollars across the future decades based on a decision that's made in 2011 or 2012, et cetera. So to me, there's nothing redundant about this, and there's nothing that I can see in this that is in any way inconsistent with our fiduciary and legal responsibilities to our rate payers. And when it comes to us trying to be as transparent and as open as possible. So I'd just like to thank Councilmember Englander for – you know, he just got on the council, but he certainly had his eye 
on uh, certain matters that are important to him and important to many of us and i just want to thank him for making sure that he didn't skip a beat and that we keep this moving forward thank you for purposes of clarification we should refer to this particular report as the smith report or councilman greg smith report so it's clear that that was the originating um legislator who did this so there's no confusion down the road um i see this as a a very innocuous uh motion um and and i'm when when you look at the motion and break it down it's it's uh we're already doing the independent analysis um it's just a question of whether or not the ratepayer advocate considers it and all the motion is doing is asking them requesting them to consider it i, I can't imagine why they wouldn't want to consider it if it's available um so i, I don't I, I think it's harmless in that respect um but secondly uh i i'm concerned with the language that says upon an approval of water and power rate proposals by the board of water and power commissioners mr chair madam chair i i asked that you listen here because i there may be some un unintended consequences here it says i further move that upon an approval of water and power rate proposals by the board of water and power commissioners that the opa's independent analysis report be submitted to council and the mayor i would think it would be submitted anyway why why would it only be upon the approval of dwp may i clarify that um yeah it's because actions only come to council once they've been approved by the dwp board unless council takes jurisdiction no, but the, no 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 this isn't saying the action this is saying the report right uh, why couldn't we get approval, we should get the report anyway it's our it's our report it's upon approval of the rate proposal so then the rate proposal would come to council as a matter of course no that's not what this that's not what this says let me read it again i further move that the last paragraph i further move that upon approval of the water and power rate proposals by water the uh, <coughs> board of water power commissioners that the opa's independent analysis report be submitted to council and the mayor we should get it anyway it's our report right you you would have it anyway it just indicates that you would have it for review for the rate review i i think i think i um after the second time you read that council member Alarcon, i think what it, what it means is i think it's obvious that we will have had the report before that because very likely the report will have been submitted and and prior to that last paragraph action but but the fact that it be submitted with so that it, it's no question that it's concurrently part of the information that is forwarded to us by the department when we're actually contemplating their actions. Yeah. What, what it's simply doing. Yes, it is redundant. Yeah. It's simply the existing process calls for. There's that process where we have the steps. We do independent third-party report, and then that report gets submitted once the board, if they approve a, a rate action, then that report, whether it's PAs or Huron, gets submitted well, to the council. Uh, Madam Chair, all I'm saying is, w we should have access to that report before or whenever we want to. Yes, we do. So why why do we only get it after? by this motion we would only get it after perhaps the committee report would reflect the instruction to submit that right. well, why don't we do it like that so yeah. you're yeah. satisfied yeah it, i just okay. want yeah, it is redundant okay. okay. it, it's not it's not a question of redundancy the committee report yeah. with language that <laughs> sets forth your concern it will be redundant once we make that clarification okay but, but it will be on the record and that's <laughs> a redundancy on the record exactly. so, yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> story of my life okay. Good. Okay. No, it's real clear. With concurrent. No doubts. Okay, to all bodies. All right, so we're clear on that one? Yeah. It's okay. not clear that it's redundant. We will make it clear that it's redundant. <laughs> yeah, we will, yeah, we'll I'm, not, I'm, not, redundant. I'm not even understanding what the redundancy is. But, but my question is, are we going to get the report before they approve the rate increase? I just yes. want to make sure we Why get it. We, we it get it whenever we want it. Absolutely. <laughs> in plain, plain language, yeah. that yeah. we will amend the report to require that the report is provided to members uh, as soon as it is as done. soon as it is issued yeah okay so there you go Madam Chair, and then um, I'm not clear in this motion whether it's only instructing us last paragraph is going to come I, I'm not clear on whether uh, this motion is only instructing us to do this for this particular rate increase or as an indefinite process no, 
definitely. For this and indefinite. The motion actually specifies the June 2011 proposal. So it would be for this process as well as ongoing. Yeah, I, I, I would be fine with it for this particular year. Once we have uh, a more defined process and a rate payer advocate in place, <laughs> et cetera, um, I might have some of the same concerns and I might personally prefer to see that office direct whatever kind of independent review they find necessary to, uh, to uh, get to the bottom of the information that they need. Um, I think right now it won't be very established, so uh, I think we certainly would want to rely on, uh, on uh, this independent review, but uh, after that I'm not committed to it. So. Why don't, we, why don't we do this? Why don't we vote, vote the way you want to vote today if you want to make some amendments on the council floor or put some sort of a sunset or timeline provision in to see if you can get the votes for it or give you a chance to talk with Mr. Englander about it and see what his intention is. If you feel like you want to vote against it today, that's okay too and we still have a quorum. No, I'll, I'll, I'll vote for it, but we'll, we'll have those discussions okay. before it makes the floor. I think that's reasonable. All right, so with that, uh, we'll move this without objection to no council. Mm -hmm. no, we have Dr. Williams. As amended. As amended. As amended. Yes. With that, I would want amend it. As amended and clarified. And, and clarified. By, by the Thank you. This is the attention to detail we need with respect to DWP increases. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, thank you. That marks the end of items on our agenda. I'll do public comment. Um, this is the portion of the meeting for items that are not on the agenda, public comment. We do have one card from Dr. Williams. So Dr. Williams, if you will. I'm going to get short and sweet. Let's have a ratepayers advocate for the Department of Public Works because their bill is twice as much as my DWP bill. And I don't know any accountability of the public works rates and where the money is going, where it comes from, how much. So how about a rate payers advocate or office of public accountability for the Department of Public Works? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. All right, that marks the end of our meeting. There's no other individuals coming forward.